Hello and thank you for joining us for ArcelorMittal's webinar with Automotive Manufacturing Solutions. My name is Gareth Price. I'm the Assistant Editor here at Automotive Manufacturing Solutions. Today I'm joined by Siegfried Jacobs, Portfolio Director of the group's global R&D activities in electrical steels. Today's webinar will examine how to use eye care electrical steels for top performance in electrified powertrains. Since the launch in 2012, ArcelorMittal's eye care electrical steels for automotive traction have assisted OEMs to achieve significant powertrain performance enhancements in both electrical and hybrid vehicles. Sigrid will describe how the updated eye care steels can realize performance targets for traction motors. Before we start, I want to remind everyone joining us today to put your questions to Sigrid and she'll respond in the Q&A session that follows her presentation. Just type your questions into the box in the lower right hand side of your screen. If you experience any technical issues during this session, please let us know via the Q&A box and our team will try to fix it. We hope you'll find this webinar stimulating and informative. And now I'll hand you over to Sigrid for the presentation. Oh, hello to everybody. I will talk to you about the eye care electrical steels and the impact they can have on your electrified powertrain. The presentation will contain some elements on ArcelorMittal electrical steels. Then I will show you the benefits of using eye care electrical steels in a typical automotive application and show you the way we can help you with advanced technical support and then we will come to the conclusion. So ArcelorMittal is a key supplier for large high efficiency machines. So we are used to providing very low loss electrical steels for the um, top performance machines in, um, in different power station types and the declination into automotive electrical steel types has been done since uh, many years, but we are uh, worldwide known for our low loss grades. We produce electrical steels in different parts of the world. Um, you can see on the map there is a plant in the Czech Republic. This particular plant produces grain oriented electrical steel. That is the type of electrical steel which is used in transformers because it has very good magnetic properties in the direction uh, of rolling which you can then use as a direction of the leg of the transformer. We produce non-oriented electrical steels and that are the ones which are best for rotating machines and um, all of the plants that are on the map. The non-oriented electrical steels are subdivided in fully processed and semi-processed electrical steels. The semi-processed electrical steels are uh, the type that needs an annealing cycle after punching before the laminations are uh, um, brought together and the, the motor is wound. Um, those semi-process types are being produced essentially in Germany, in Eisenhüttenstadt, and in the United States and uh, Canada. Over there they are called cold, uh, cold rolled motor laminations, but it's in fact similar as the name uh, semi-processed. Those types, so the semi-process types, are not suited for automotive traction because they don't have a very good performance at high frequencies. The grades that have the best performance for automotive traction are produced in the plant we have in France, in essentially Depchy, which is somewhere in the middle of France. And um, it is dedicated to producing the low losses um, at high frequencies that are necessary. The plant in Saint-Chély is um, producing steels for uh, use in, the, in Europe, but we also have a substantial part of production that is being exported um, to countries such as uh, China, India, the United States. Um, that, that is um, for two reasons. First of all, because there are our global customers that want us to follow them uh, globally, and on the other hand, um, it is because those uh, steels are not produced in so many plants over the world and therefore local customers also need to uh, import those type of steels, for instance, in the United States. The um, electrical steels are particular compared to 
um, other steels and I will now try to explain why you need electrical steels in an electrical machine. The functioning of an electrical machine is in fact based on the, the point that you do uh, have copper windings here drawn in blue, you put a uh, current into this copper windings and this current injection will lead to a magnetic field that is going to be able to generate um, a flux and such a flux will be able to um, deliver a torque in an electrical machine and hence a power output. The whole point of the electrical steel is that when you put steel inside this coil of copper, you will generate more flux than if you didn't put anything in it. And that is because of the fact that steel is ferromagnetic and it has a flux concentration effect. The property which describes this flux concentration effect is described in this magnetizing loop on the right hand side which gives you the amount of magnetizing current you need to achieve a certain induction level that will be proportional uh, to the flux that is generating the torque. So the primary role of electrical steels is to have a very good polarization level, a very good induction level and that this means that you need little magnetizing current in order to achieve a high um, flux in the air gap. So that's the primary role. With such a good magnetizing curve you will be able to make um, a motor with more power or in the reverse situation have a generator that can uh, produce more uh, current or in the fact uh, for a transformer you will have a higher level of um, uh, power transformation from one voltage level uh, to the other. Now what's happening in the steel during this uh, process of um, flux generation is in fact that there is a magnetization process going on. The inside of the steel is changing in, term of, in terms of magnetic structure and um, this will lead to um, losses inside of the steel. That's in fact why a motor is warming up when you make it run. It is because inside of the steel there are irreversible processes that generate heat which is not effective to the um, mechanical power output. So we want to have electrical steels that have um, a good uh, flux generation and do this with uh, minimal losses. And that, those are the most important properties of the electrical steels. So on the next slide we have again an example of a few materials. Here the example on the right hand side is a, um, uh, an industry grade. It's not so important, 0 0.35, 0 0.5. It's just to make the point that for a given uh, loss level it is possible to make materials that have different behavior in terms of magnetizing uh, curve. And this means that in the case of this example out of the four materials, two materials have a higher magnetization graph and two other ones have a lower one. If you are then in the situation where, for instance, you would say for the torque I need to have in my motor, I want to be at a working point of 1.5 Tesla, you will have with the upper graph, you will be in a situation to need less magnetizing current than if you would have to go down to the uh, lower graph which is the less permeable material. This means that the, the way the, mater the material is behaving in terms of magnetization will have an influence on the amount of magnetizing current you need and hence also on the amount of copper that is necessary in the motor. So the use of materials with better properties in this sense will not only have a good influence on the performance of the motor but also be able to reduce the cost of the motor because you are able to use less uh, copper windings and in the general um, relationships of costing uh, copper is still quite more expensive than uh, steel is. So that was the first property we discussed 
Then the second property were the losses. Now, if you are trying to reduce the losses in steel, you go on this bottom graph from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And this is generally done by steel makers uh, by, amongst other methods, but one of the methods is to put more alloying elements in, into the material. But if you are going to put more alloying elements, and you go here to the left-hand side, um, you will, in uh, parallel, uh, reduce the saturation polarization. And that is, in fact, the furthest point on this magnetization graph. And very often, machines are working in such areas of strong uh, fields, and um, they go up to saturation. So um, whilst you are trying to make lower loss grades, you are reducing the saturation polarization, which is another good point. And also, because of the alloying content, you will have an influence on the mechanical properties, because the tensile strength uh, will go up. And the last point, but not least, is that uh, when you put more alloying elements in, and in this graph it's from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, you will reduce the thermal conductivity. So, to summarize it all, um, the way to reduce losses is something to be looked at in a very careful way. It's not simply by putting more alloying elements in it, because that has an impact impact on the saturation polarization, which is not positive. It can increase the strength, which is good if you have a, a high-speed rotor, and we will come back on that a bit later. Uh, but it can, of course, also increase the tool wear, so it's not necessarily a good point for the puncher. And when you have created in this way materials with lower losses, you will have reduced the amount of heat that is generated in the steel, but the total amount of heat that is in the motor, which is coming from the copper losses and the iron losses, still needs to be evacuated, and the thermal conductivity will have become more difficult. This is maybe a, a bit of a long story, just to tell you that there are physical interconnections between the different important properties of electrical steels, and that the ideal electrical steel that has everything at the same time is not something that comes naturally, and we work together with customers to define exactly which combination is most important for their machines, um, so we produce those exact uh, property uh, combinations. Now I need to go a little bit into the equations that describe uh, the losses in steel. Generally, they are described by the model established by um, Giorgio Bertotti, and uh, it gives you the total losses in the subdivision of hysteresis, eddy current losses, and excess losses. The um, hysteresis losses are linked to the magnetization processes that were already uh, described in the beginning of the presentation, uh, due to the processes that happen in your steel whilst you are uh, magnetizing the material. They generally are proportional to the frequency of the um, field in the, in the machine and um, have a constant that is depending on the structure of the material. The eddy current losses are related to induced currents uh, in the material and those eddy current losses can be reduced by working with thinner laminations so the steel thickness tau is here described uh, in the equation, and you can see that the eddy current losses are quite dependent on the steel thickness. So one of the methods to reduce the total losses in the steel is to work with thinner laminations. Um, on the other hand, the um, eddy current losses can also be reduced when you have a higher alloy content, so a higher electrical resistivity, and that is uh, one of the methods that I said before that can be used, so alloying can help you reduce the losses. You should also notice now that the eddy current losses are proportional to the square of the frequency. The excess losses are a bit more difficult to explain because it's related to the magnetic domain wall movement, so the changes in the magnetic structure inside of the material and the induced uh, fields that are associated with that. 
um, those can also be reduced by working with higher resistivity material and also are influenced by the thickness of the steel. The, the most important point for automotive applications is that uh, they are proportional with a power 1.5 of the frequency. So we have hysteresis is the frequency, eddy currents the square of the frequency, and excess the frequency to the power 1.5. This brings us to the next point, um, that if you have uh, the total of the losses and you want to put it here in a graph, it's easy to uh, make a representation by dividing the losses by the frequency and then you find the hysteresis losses as a constant term, the eddy current losses as this uh, linear term, and then the excess losses have the, the, the square root uh, equation. Now, um, it is important to realize how your machine is going to be exploited, because if you are, for instance, using a material that at 50 hertz, let's imagine uh, there is a working point here that this line, this point, or maybe the, the point where the blue arrows are, is 50 hertz. Then you can have, um, with this 50 hertz, uh, and you are working in an application where you have to have 50 hertz guarantees, uh, you can have a grade, for instance, a material as it is defined for industry, uh, that has 3.3 uh, watt per kilograms, so it's the grade M330 35A, uh, the one with 3.3 watt per kilograms um, losses. Is this, in fact, um, the total losses that are guaranteed? Which then the steel supplier chooses how he divides it up in hysteresis, eddy current, and excess losses, and this will be done. Um, by the way, he is um, choosing an alloy content, a structure, and a texture. Now, it's very well possible to choose uh, a material that has um, a low hysteresis loss and fairly high eddy current losses and excess losses. So that would be one material that brings you up to the 3.3 watt per kilograms. But he could also choose a material with relatively higher hysteresis losses and then relatively lower excess and um, eddy current uh, losses. The point is that those two materials will not have the same behavior when you go up into the high frequency area of um, the working uh, that you do with an automotive traction machine. So, if you have a material that will have low hysteresis losses at 50 Hz and high uh, proportion of the eddy current and excess losses, so in that uh, material, the high frequency behavior will be worse um, than a material that has done the inverse thing, that is essentially working on a reduction of eddy current and excess losses and leaving the hysteresis losses a bit higher. The point I'm trying to explain this situation is because we still see um, specifications in automotive that are relating to industry materials and that are just mentioning the losses that need to be guaranteed at 50 Hertz. And if this is done, you will have an unpredictable behavior of the material, of the machine, sorry, at higher frequencies because you will have the possibility that by using steels from different suppliers uh, you will have a very different results at frequencies of 400 Hz or 1 kHz. So it is important to make the specific uh, steels for automotive that behave well at high frequencies and to do specifications uh, that describe these properties very clearly. So this summarizes a little bit our point of view on how we should propose our materials. There are machines that need very low uh, losses because for the application the efficiency is the most important uh, uh, property. There are other machines that need um, a higher torque development. You want a higher permeability grade or maybe you're doing it uh, because you want to save on the copper cost. Then there are other machines which have 
an, a, a problem in the uh, thermal situation, which is quite often the case if you are um, looking in, for instance, uh, uh, not only automotive, because there are obviously cooling of the motor is also a big problem, um, but also in um, ship propulsion, because then the, uh, you only have the seawater to cool the motor. And then there is the high strength uh, need. Um, when machines can run at a higher speed, they become more compact and uh, you can have a higher power density. So if you can make a rotor that has a higher uh, steel with a higher strength level, uh, you can bring the machine to smaller proportions. So first of all, we have developed these different steel types for 50 and 60 hertz according to Euro standards, to IEC standards. Um, and then the next step was to um, make similar products, but then more particularly suited for higher frequencies, so 400 hertz and above. So in 2012, we launched iCare. iCare is our branding of automotive grades, and that's why it has the name car in the word. I stands for innovative and E for environment. And we have declined them into the safe range with um, lower losses to save weight, the torque range with higher uh, torque development possibilities, and the speed range that have the strength to allow the rotors to spin at a higher speed. The naming of these uh, different grades is done um, the way um, it's been described in the standard. Um, in the meantime, so um, there was in fact no standard on those grades and um, we launched the products using our own uh, branding uh, name in which the uh, word safe stands for the type of the product. The thickness uh, 20 stands for a thickness of uh, 0.2 millimeters and it goes up to uh, 0.35 millimeters and then the two numbers uh, behind uh, the hyphen are the losses that we guarantee at one Tesla uh, 400 Hertz. Um, so uh, in the meantime we've uh, participated in establishing the European and the IEC standard and they copy this kind of naming. Uh, the thing is the word safe is then not uh, included but it is mentioned as NO for non-oriented so you will find in those standards NO2013 or NO2015 and, and so on. Um, the guaranteed polarization we have is 1.60 Tesla at 5,000 amps per meter. Um, uh, that is for certain grades better than the standard, but that's what we do uh, in the safe products. So the safe products are the materials where we focus on losses in the first priority with a uh, polarization that is good for permanent magnet machines. Um, it uh, depends on the way the machine is being designed, whether this is good enough, but it is um, uh, being used now in um, uh, electrical machines that are uh, running on the streets. Um, the torque uh, material is a second development um, where we um, brought the polarization above 1.65 Tesla. Torque materials are the, therefore better suited for induction machines, but also permanent magnet machines can benefit from this higher polarization level. Again, it depends on design parameters um, of, the, of the machine, whether this is uh, beneficial or whether it doesn't bring much. And those torque grades also have um, a thickness from 0 0.2 to 0 0.35 uh, millimeters. Then we come to the speed materials. In this case, there is still the thickness of 0 0.35. And then the second um, part are the numbers, and those represent the guaranteed yield strength and the longitudinal direction, because that's generally just a little bit weaker than the tensor, uh, than the transverse direction, sorry. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, the guaranteed <coughs> losses, oh, sorry, I'll have a drink. The, <coughs> the guaranteed losses for these material are a bit higher, they are not in the name, 
the DR23 and 28 uh, watt per kilogram, which is quite a good compromise. It's higher than for the safe materials, um, but it is good enough for a rotor, which generally speaking uh, will not have such a high loss level in um, permanent magnet machines. We could find other compromises with other strength levels and other losses, but um, in the discussions we had uh, with customers, uh, this is quite a good loss level for such a higher strength uh, material. And the guaranteed polarization is a little bit in between the safe and the torque. Those materials, as I said, were, are produced in our production site in France. The uh, most critical part of the production is the uh, continuous annealing line, which is a very long horizontal furnace. It's important for electrical steels to work with horizontal furnaces because we have to anneal the material at very high temperature and um, with the structure of electrical steels, when you go up to these high temperatures, the material behavior is, as we said, it ra it's rather like chewing gum than it, is, than it still is uh, like steel. So it's, be it's becoming quite um, difficult to handle it. And if you would do it on a classic vertical annealing line, which is done in other automotive grades, um, you would simply have too much force on the material and you would not be able to make such kind of magnetic properties because you would destroy the structure and the texture. Another uh, important part of the line is here at the bottom, the coating sections with a three roll system to be able to apply the uh, coatings in a precise way. For automotive, we need to produce thin coatings and um, uh, thin coatings with a precise thickness. If the coating is too thin, there might be um, hot spots in the machines because there's not enough um, insulation. If the, material, the coating is too thick, then you will lose in the uh, traction machine in stacking factor and therefore in compactness um, of the motor. So that's quite a critical point in um, automotive uh, steels. The picture here at the right hand side is just about side trimming. It, it's not so important, but it's for the view. And uh, at the bottom right is where the line is in saint chély de which is in a very beautiful region from France that you can see uh, in the environmental picture as well. Now, uh, let me go a bit further and talk to you about our technical support. Our technical support goes into two um, ways. We have uh, magnetic uh, technical support and we have mechanical technical support. Um, First, I will show you an exercise uh, of, uh, magnet, of magnetic technical support and how we, and generally speaking, um, help customers uh, if they need uh, assistance in choosing the best materials. So in this case, we have taken, taken um, different machines that can be used in traction. Um, generally speaking, most of the motors are um, permanent magnet synchronous machines, and that is the type that is on the top of the uh, right-hand side. Um, there is also the possibility to use round rotor synchronous machines, and that's the middle uh, drawing. And then there is the induction machine, uh, which is in fact the first machine that was used for traction, um, then has been replaced, uh, I would say, um, by the permanent magnet machines coming up. Um, then I would say if you go back through the history, um, there was a, a peak pricing uh, in permanent magnets which got the whole market a bit scared about the situation regarding um, permanent magnet pricing and the volatility it could bring in pricing of the motors, which um, then led to a review on the possibility of using induction machines, uh, induction machines that can be uh, classically used in industry with an aluminium rotor, but can be brought to a higher performance um, with um, a copper rotor. So um, we have made here a comparison on um, machines um, with a specific power level, and we have done some calculations to show you how um, a steel choice can affect uh, the performance. How do we do this sort of work generally? We have very 
advanced magnetic characterization tools. Um, we can not only do the magnetic measurements in the Epstein frame as is written on the certificates of our materials, uh, but we can do um, also additional testing to cope for the influence of punching, the influence of the fact that your motor is not running at 20 degrees but uh, above 100 degrees for permanent magnet machines or higher still for an induction machine, that you will have uh, put a stator housing around your stator which will have induced stresses and that you will have induced stresses also on the rotor when you fix the axis in the rotor. Um, and those influence the um, input data that you need to use for finite element calculations. If you use the basic Epstein data, uh, you will find the difference between the calculated and the measured machine that can be quite substantial. And that's why we have many projects, many uh, publications also on um, the kind of modeling work where we provide improved data to our customers. They do the finite element calculations and then we work with a, um, an interface that allows to do the post-processing of the um, loss calculations with the specific ArcelorMittal model that also takes into account all these manufacturing um, elements uh, that changes the uh, properties of the steel and also take into account rotational losses behind the teeth and higher harmonics that are obviously there um, for different reasons, uh, the geometry, the, the fields and so on, the PWM supply and so on. So um, that's the aspect of modeling. Once we have done such a modeling uh, exercise with a customer, then normally a prototype is built, it's measured up, it's looked at whether it satisfies the expectation or not. And uh, when the machine measurements then show that there still needs to be an improvement made, then we do um, loop back and come back into a different choice of material and do the exercise of modeling um, again. Right. What I am showing now is a modeling exercise we did in-house, so um, that's the only thing I can show obviously in such a webinar. And it is an exercise where we compare materials in a specific machine with a, a certain two-day two-dimensional design of the laminations. We work at a fixed power level, at a fixed speed, so just one operation point. That means we work at one uh, torque level. Of course you can do the whole uh, uh, drive cycle, but this is just a simple example, not to overcomplicate to explain the way it works. And then if we put in different materials, you will have a different performance we then change the stack height so that the comparison is at the same torque level. This then will mean that your machine will become different in size and that you will have a different efficiency because your losses will be different and that you will have a different uh, power density. Now, here is uh, the example, a permanent magnet synchronous machine and a wound rotor synchronous machine um, with uh, the same uh, nominal uh, torque and um, the reference material is the M33035A, uh, which I mentioned before, which is an um, industry type of material that was in fact um, the beginning of many um, hybrid motors. Uh, quite a while ago, uh, I would say that's the, the state of the art of uh, the machines that were designed, uh, let's say, 10 years ago or even longer ago um, to use such types of materials. You can already see that if you work with a permanent magnet machine that your actual length is shorter than if you have a wound rotor synchronous machine. Um, so that is not going to be as compact as the permanent magnet machine, which is quite uh, expected, it's logical, um, but it's, um, it's just uh, to show that there are these alternatives 
and the permanent magnet is of course with the expensive permanent magnets and this can be a cheaper solution depending of course also on the electronics behind it but that will lead us into much detail uh, for now and um, here is the result let me guide you through the tables we have the 33035A as an industry uh, standard and consider this the reference results of the machines the first option that some um, machine producers tested was to say ah, I want to have a higher torque density so I will use a high permeability material so that's to remind you about the graphs I showed in the beginning so that is the material with a higher magnetization graph and if you do that you can indeed see that um, the torque density is going to go up so you will have more torque you can make the uh, stack shorter so you make uh, uh, the volume uh, smaller and so it has an influence on the compactness but what is the wrong choice is in fact the point that such high permeability materials are not suited for high frequency behavior uh, generally speaking high permeability materials for industry have lower alloy content than the standard ones and it's just this lower alloy content if you remember the formula for the eddy current losses and for the excess losses that will be problematic for all the higher frequencies that happen in the machine the base frequencies and and the harmonics so um, that's in fact the starting point staying in industry grades is not a good idea if you want to go to a better performance of the uh, machine um, then you can say I will go to uh, save materials I will go to um, thinner grades and I'm taking immediately the example of a very thin grade, a 0 0.2 uh, millimeter material. Um, in this case, 0 0.2 millimeter, uh, remember the thickness uh, was also in the formula for the eddy current and the excess losses, so that's quite good because you have reduced the active material losses and you have increased the efficiency. Um, but um, in this case of this machine, so the, 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 the material uh, did not have a better torque performance because it doesn't have uh, a very high uh, polarization graph. Uh, that's not the case with the safe material. So uh, what should you then do if you want both a high efficiency machine and you want to have a very compact machine, then you need to consider the torque rates and I'm very sorry but I just noticed there is still a typing error it says torque here it should be torque and here as well I'm sorry about that um, so these are the two torque grades under analysis the um, torque grades um, will let's go back to the thinnest uh, uh, choice um, or here the 0 0.3 millimeter torque um, what you will see is that you will have uh, a loss reduction if you compare it to this one you can have a very strong loss reduction and the loss reduction will be the biggest when the, the torque material is the, the, the thinnest and then you can have a um, uh, a polarization increase uh, and that will bring you the better uh, torque uh, density and therefore also um, the smaller volume of the machine so in this exercise um, the torque choice is in fact the best if you want both properties to be optimized if you're saying I only really want the lowest possible loss uh, machine then uh, you can uh, better go uh, or you can go as well to the safe in 0.2 millimeter material that's another option so it all depends on what the restrictions in the powertrain are if you are looking for a motor that is giving a very good um, sporty feeling to the car saying you have a very good breakaway torque and a good uh, dynamic reaction um, then the torque materials are uh, certainly to be preferred um, but if you want to save on the um, batteries and not use too much current then obviously uh, the lower loss levels are the ones to choose either from safe or from torque rates with low losses 
The other machine, the wound row the synchronous machine, gives in fact a similar uh, conclusion. The only thing is that because it doesn't have permanent magnets and the flux is generated by the, the copper windings and the materials in the rotor and the stator, the effect of the higher permeability will be stronger than it is in a, uh, in a um, magnet machine. So the use of higher uh, permeability torque rates is even more beneficial, relatively speaking, for a wound rotor synchronous machine. So, um, the um, conclusion regarding the iron loss modeling, uh, we have an iron uh, loss model. It um, is an improved version of the Bertotti uh, model and um, it also includes all the relevant machine production aspects and um, it can bring the uh, difference between calculated machine performance and measured machine performance to, um, to, to a much smaller range. In the projects we have had with customers, we have done it on many different types of machines, uh, both industry and automotive, um, and we always see that when you uh, use the improved material data, um, you can in fact reduce um, the work you need to do on prototypes because the predictions of the calculations are better. And uh, as I said before, uh, we do this in a way that we pr can provide input data to the customer, that there is a flat file data transfer between the customer's field calculations and our loss model so that we don't need to know uh, their uh, design uh, but still can do the calculations in post-processing and uh, work together on an optimized solution. Let me now go to the mechanical aspects of um, machine design. It's obviously um, quite critical in a permanent magnet machine to have a very good idea of when the permanent magnets will break out. That's the sphere of every motor producer. You have these permanent magnets that are sitting in the rotor, uh, quite close to the edge of the uh, rotor. There is a narrow bridge that keeps them on their spot. This bridge is subjected to centrifugal forces simply because of the speed, um, but also to fatigue forces because there are a lot of dynamic cycles when um, the car is always uh, slowing uh, uh, and, um, and um, getting faster and getting slower. So um, we need to be able to provide um, mechanical properties uh, not only at room temperature but at the real temperatures in the machine um, to give them a, in a static way, so ju just for the basic calculations of um, whether the design will not go beyond the yield strength and there cannot be plastic deformation that would make a contact between the rotor and the stator but also to give fatigue data so it can be analyzed uh, whether also in the fatigue situation no cracking will occur um, close to these magnet uh, slots. So the point which is quite good to represent all this data is to work with the classical fatigue uh, curves and also to represent it uh, on a diagram as we do here where you have um, a representation of the static performance that says you need to be at the left hand side of this pink graph in order to be in a safe exploitation area in order to stay below the yield strength limits and those fitted um, fatigue uh, limits that tell you you need to stay underneath this fatigue uh, area so in fact it is um, the total limitation of the exploitation of the material is a combination of the uh, fatigue limit uh, here at the left hand side of the graph and then the yield strength here and what we then do is to provide such graphs at different conditions different temperatures and um, different states of the uh, edges of the material they can be punched they can be laser cut it all can be done with different preparation methods so we have quite a full um, description of how the material behaves and we also work on customer geometries that are specific
to their designs to show whether they, those designs will last the way the customer expects them to last. So this brings me to the general conclusion that we try to be more than a steel producer. We have the very um, high performance electrical steels that are needed for automotive applications. We assist the customers in providing the most efficient uh, input data for the calculations and to help the designs to make the mechanical design more easy, to make the magnetic design more accurate and also to do the, the correct uh, thermal design. And that is then um, partly done through our own iron loss calculation tools. And that's what I wanted to say um, so far. So thank you for listening. OK, thanks, Sigrid. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, we'll start looking now at some questions that have been sent in. Um, but I would still ask everybody, please do continue sending your questions for uh, Sigrid. Uh, but the, the first one uh, for you, Sigrid. Uh, in what phase of production is the IKEA range? Are you producing on pilot lines or on industrial lines? Are, are there yes, a so. Um, production with it? Yeah. Yes, iCare is now, um, is, as I said, since 2012 um, on the market. It's produced on um, the mass production lines in saint -Chely. Uh We have um, those in, um, in um, running vehicles uh, on the market. So it isn't just prototyping and pilot lines. It is, uh, it's happening and it's running and it's working. Okay, um, so, uh, uh, more of a detailed question now, um, regarding coatings, uh, do coatings also help to minimize uh, hysteresis losses? Um, in fact, coatings help to minimize eddy current losses. Coatings will make sure that um, the induced fields stay within the lamination that they are induced and cannot cross to another lamination. That's why uh, we use, in fact, laminated steel. But if you would put the laminated steel without any insulation, the one on top of the other, you would get back to a bulk situation and you would have very high um, eddy current losses. So it's rather for the eddy current losses than for the hysteresis losses. Maybe the question is rather related to the way it works in grain-oriented material, where you can have the coatings um, perform a sort of traction on the surface that changes the state of the magnetic domains and then influences the excess losses. Um, but for non-oriented material, this is much lesser an effect than the eddy current effect. OK. Um, another question about... Uh... Uh, hysteresis losses. Um, do the high-speed machines operate at higher frequency and um, uh, and therefore become more significantly affected by hysteresis losses? So the fact that the higher frequencies occur in a um, traction motor and much less low frequencies, if you look at it over an entire drive cycle, will mean that the relative importance of hysteresis losses is smaller for a steel for electric traction. And uh, another question here from uh, regarding the, uh, the punching process. Um, how does the punching process affect the performance of an electrical machine? Do uh, the questioner asks, do you have any recommendation uh, for her to tell the puncher? Yes, the punching effect has a, is a, can degrade the properties of the magnetic, uh, of the magnetic materials in different ways. Um, it needs interaction with the puncher on um, the way the tool is set up, the strategy he uses in terms of grinding, um, so it is important to to go into more detail into those elements, but I think it will be a bit long to do this all on the phone now. Uh, 
Maybe it's something we can handle in more detail well, at some other point of time. Yes, it's um, uh, something I, I would mention that uh, all the questions uh, will be uh, sent along to Sigrid, even, even the ones we don't have an opportunity to look at now. So um, uh, Sigrid and her colleagues will be able to respond uh, in greater detail uh, uh, offline once, the, um, uh, once we've passed over the questions. Uh, but uh, if we can work through a couple more um, that have uh, been sent in. Uh, 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 one, uh, somebody wants to know, is it possible to investigate the effect of biaxial mechanical stresses? The, um, the, the effect of stresses is um, normally done uh, in plane and um, in the actual direction, so that's um, uh, um, opposite of the plane direction of the steel. So by actual, it depends on in which direction you mean. If you think it's relevant to do it in the longitudinal and the transverse direction, um, I'm not convinced that that is a very uh, important uh, measurement to make. It's already very relevant to do it in the in plane situation, or else to do it in the um, uh, the opposite direction, so that is in the thickness direction of the steel. That again is a question that needs a, a bit more detail to to properly explain what is meant with biaxial in this case. Okay, yes, but uh, one to explore further at a later time. Uh, another question asks, uh, or he mentions, uh, you didn't. Uh, you didn't discuss applications for uh, asynchronous machines. Uh, are these becoming less common in EV traction machine applications? The wound rotor synchronous machine, is that what is the question? Or uh, which machine? I didn't quite get it. Asynchronous machines, are they becoming less common oh, okay. in EV applications? Um, no. In, in no, I didn't uh, discuss it in detail. I, I thought it was going to be too long. Um, no, on the contrary. As I said, induction machines have been um, the first ones developed for um, electric traction. Uh, we did those uh, 15 years ago or even longer ago. Um, then, because of this possibility to use permanent magnets, there was a general shift towards permanent magnet machines, and they, uh, the capacity is the best. But then um, there are now electric vehicles running uh, on the streets with induction machines. Um, and um, this has meant that there is a whole new revival in the research on the use of induction machines. So it isn't, uh, it isn't gone. It's been coming back, in fact. OK, uh, um, just returning to coatings uh, for the next question. Um, which surface coatings uh, are available? For uh, traction machines, normally the most used is a C5 coating, uh, which means it has an organic and an inorganic component. And the um, inorganic component is the one that is interesting because it uh, allows you to have a higher temperature resistance. It also allows you to have a good uh, resistance uh, in, against the behavior in transmission oil. And um, that is, in fact, the one which is uh, mostly used. So C5 is, um, is the best type. Within the C5, there are several uh, subdivisions. And then it depends on the application of the customer, which subdivision is the best choice. And um, next question regarding uh, lamination materials. Um, the questioner asks, do you consider different lamination materials uh, during your co-engineering with customers, uh, or, is, or, or is this part of um, uh, is this something you supply? Well, yes. So. Um... Normally, a customer has an idea about the yield strength he wants for the material, the losses he wants, the polarization he wants. 
uh, and then that's the starting point and then the calculations are made and comparisons are made by using the different uh, data files of the materials to check which material is maybe more suited for one part of the behavior and another material for another part of the behavior. So those are the typical comparisons we make uh, with customers and after such uh, a comparison in, in calculations, uh, then one material is chosen to go on into prototyping. Okay, um, probably just got time for a couple more to uh, put to you, Sigrid. Uh, uh, you mentioned the production uh, that uh, takes place in France. Um, uh, how is your supply to other parts of the world, such as uh, North America, South America, or Asia? Yeah, so we do supply to different parts of the world, um, to China, to India, to the United States, uh, Mexico, and so on, um, because essentially we have been following um, global customers and they, and they are in different parts of the world. We also have local customers that work with our materials, um, punchers uh, in different parts of the world and then uh, they also um, use our materials. So um, it's not just, it's certainly not all staying in France. I think um, most of it of the material is going to the rest of Europe and then there is also a substantial fraction exported to uh, other parts of the world. Okay, if, uh, just one final question then, if we may. Um, what would you say was the ideal moment for um, OEM to involve uh, the help of ArcelorMittal uh, when de designing uh, e-machines? Well, it's always best to be there quite early. Um, obviously, machine designs will change during the process of designing the machine. But if already a machine design is fixed and then only there is a discussion about which would be the best type, then it is quite possible that you cannot fully exploit all the properties of the electrical steel in the best way. So we are um, uh, always um, proposing to, to work in an early stage. Um, and that's exactly what we are doing. Once one vehicle is on the on the market, on the road, um, we already are working with the end user to for the next generation, and that's then normally, uh, yeah, the between the beginning and the end of life of a vehicle is typically probably five years or something like that. So we are quite early involved, and th those projects have the best success rate because um, if it's not done that way, if you just are um, going into a powertrain choice, then have it run on first car prototypes and then see things you don't like, it's very difficult to make it all uh, work out fine by, by changing design and materials. And it's also quite risky. Uh, you need to be able to do sufficient prototyping to get it all checked. Well, thank you very much, Sigrid, for a very infor informative webinar. Um, the, the questions we didn't get the opportunity to put to you uh, we'll send those along with, with, the, uh, with the other ones as well. So um, anyone who didn't hear the question uh, uh, addressed, um, Sigrid is obviously happy to take that up with you uh, later. Um, the webinar itself, we'll, we'll be uploading this to the AMS archives, uh, so it'll be uh, accessible in future for any of your colleagues who've been unable to join us for the live presentation. Uh, you can access this and all of our previous webinars via the webinar tab at the AMS homepage. Uh, we'd like to get your feedback on, on this webinar, so uh, there's a short survey coming up. Please take the time to complete that. Uh, we very much appreciate your input. Uh, so thanks again to everyone for taking part with us today. Um, we hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. Bye for now.